Hi here. Hi everyone. Thanks for coming here. I am uh, Amit Joshi, software engineer with Google. Uh, I'm a tech lead for Chrome Frame. Hi, I'm Alex Russell. I'm also a software engineer at Google, working on Chrome Frame and the web platform more generally. Uh, just so kind of a little gut check. How many of you are or have heard of Chrome Frame already? Wow. Holy crap. I thought nobody had. That's awesome. Um, and how many of you are, are either sending the meta tag or the headers in your sites or are prompting your users to install Chrome Frame today? OK. All right. Cool. So there, there is some awesome. new stuff to cover. Yeah. All right. So um, I think it's important uh, when we talk about uh, browser technology to kind of get a sense for how it is that we got to exactly where we are today. Because it's not entirely clear that the browser world would have evolved the way it has if it sort of had been left to its own devices. Um, in the early 90s, uh, when browsers were a new thing, when people were first getting online, people changed their browsers a lot, right? I don't know about you, but I remember getting a lot of CDs in the mail, which would give me a free copy of Netscape Navigator 3.2 Gold if I only signed up for so-and-so's online service. Um, and that was pretty good. Uh, I could get a free browser. I mean, I beat having to you know, take myself down to CompUSA and uh, buy myself a, a browser in shrink wrap uh, and install it from floppies. Uh, so instead, um, we wound up in a place where browsers got free, um, the cheapest kind of free you can get. Uh, they, there's competition among free browsers. And in fact, um, things got so good, things got so stable that users sort of in many ways stopped having to expect that they had to go hunt for a browser. And so uh, by the end of the late 90s and the early 2000s, uh, we were at a place where we sort of, I call them kind of like the ice ages of the browser wars. Um, Netscape 4 had lost, IE had won, and for all intents and purposes, the web was on the desktop. That's where the web was. And so in the mid-2000s, we saw IE6 sort of take the crown. Um, IE6 went to Goldmaster in 2001, uh, if you can remember that far back. And that was the shipping best browser you could get uh, for, for most folks from 2001 to 2006. Firefox came, Firefox, came, ah. uh, Firefox came along, and the Mozilla Foundation did a great job to inject some competition into the browser, browser space. And from 2006 till now, we've had this great thaw, right? It went from 90 plus percent IE6 uh, as the dominant browser in the world to a really diverse way of um, looking at how I, as a user, can experience the web. It's not just I can pick this browser or that browser. Browsers give me a lot of options. They give me plugins. They give me extensions. They give me applications. Browsers have turned into, in many ways, the full embodiment of an operating system. And Chrome OS is a great example of exactly that. Browsers have, like, the manifest destiny of a browser is, in many ways, to sort of make all of the hardware and software that's available in your computer accessible to web developers and then make that possible for you to experience great applications um, in a safe, secure, and portable way. And so we're in a place now where that promise is being delivered upon by the best browsers. Firefox 4 is a great example. Chrome, I like to think, is a great example. Opera, Safari, IE9, they're all doing a great job of delivering a lot of the power that's sitting, has been sitting latent inside of our computers for a very long time. Things like the file API, things like Canvas, things like SVG. They're making it possible to take advantage of the hardware that's down there. WebGL, those sorts of things are making it um, possible to consider building entirely new types of applications on the web, things that you just couldn't do because you didn't have access to the underlying capacity before. HTML5 is sort of the vehicle for that. And like any great thaw, things don't just necessarily all get better at once. The future isn't evenly distributed yet. So what we're seeing here is that the newest, latest browsers have this incredible capacity to change the s types and style of application that you build. The way that you construct your applications can be fundamentally different. You can stop looking back over your shoulder if you can ignore old browsers. Well, things are really great in some parts of the world where you can do exactly that. We aren't necessarily burdened by the legacy of uh, a browser war won and fought a long time ago. Uh, in the mobile world, like your new shiny tablets, um, CSS3 transitions and animations are sort of de rigueur. They're sort of 
the, the kind of thing where people don't talk about how awesome it is that you have them now, they start talking about how they could be so much better. Um, they're sort of expected. They're not a thing that you're trying to shim in with a little bit of JavaScript. Gradients, rounded corners, you don't think about slicing stuff up in fireworks anymore to go build a rounded corner. Nobody does that. Instead, you just use the CSS rule that gives it to you for free, which is great both for performance and for your ability to design and iterate quickly. And better JavaScript lamp better JavaScript implementations are making it so that when we do need to go ask JavaScript to give us what we can't get in HTML and CSS natively, uh, we can do it with a lot more assurance that it's not going to slow down our pages at runtime. And at the same time, we're getting the ability to get to brand new um, types of capacity for expressing what we mean in the APIs and in the platform through new APIs like audio and video and Canvas, things that re once required plugins or weren't possible to do at all. So the mobile world is moving really, really fast because users upgrade their handsets relatively frequently, once every 24 months in the United States, maybe a little bit better. Um, that means that the, the longest that you're going to have to think about a bad browser in the first world is about two years. A, a new browser that ships today is going to be out of circulation in a couple of years in the handset world. In the mobile world, that's really great. Um, it's very difficult to sort of think about how the, the desktop world would look if it was like that, because it's not anything like that. We're still thinking about a browser today, I don't know about you, but in many major applications, it's still a t tough decision to make about whether or not you're still going to consider IE6 or IE7. These are browsers that came along um, almost a decade ago. So things are really good on the desktop in some areas, too, right? Again, the thaw doesn't happen all in one place all at once, right? You get these kettles and moraines um, while you still have a, a standing glacier in some parts of the world. Uh, we've got really fast processors on the desktop. We've got better network available. We've got WebGL and WebAudio. A lot of these things are starting to show up really fast on the desktop because browsers that are auto-updating are moving even faster than the mobile world does. We can get new versions of Chrome out to users in the time that I thought was completely impossible. We did a study a couple of years ago about uh, the auto-update rates with regards to security for Chrome. And what we saw was that because of the auto-update system in Chrome, we're able to get 90-plus percent of users up to date within a week of the launch of a new release, which is really amazing. It means that if you're targeting the Chrome Web Store or you're targeting one of these other areas where we're moving fast, you can start to take advantage of this new stuff, too. But that only is true if you can ignore the old stuff. And the new stuff is great. Mr. Do builds these amazing demos. This is WebGL. Can you believe it? Like, this is actually running in slides in HTML in my browser. This is an iframe, right? OK. This is, um, this is not a trick. This is not a video. <laughs> um, so how do we liberate ourselves to take advantage of this? Because this is sort of the white elephant. Um, this is the thing that gave us the huge gift of JavaScript. It gave us an impressive amount of new APIs back when the browser wars were first being fought. But IE is now sort of the thing that may be holding us back in some senses. And if we look at this today, a lot of sites report about 50% uh, IE usage, broadly writ. Your sites are probably going to be very different than that. Your usage may be closer to 100% if, if it's an old line enterprise. It may be closer to 0% if you're um, a new media blog or something. Uh, we see this huge divergence, but generally speaking, if I'm developing an application for sale or for consumption by a population that I don't know, a bunch of people who may be buying my app off the shelf or through a distributor, I have to still count on IE being available someplace. I can't just turn those users away. And today, that 50% is primarily composed of IE 6, 7, and 8. IE 9 was just released. It's a great browser. At the same time, though, it's not widely available. It isn't being auto-updated at the same rates that Chrome is. So IE 8 is the end of the line for Windows XP as well. It's not just that we have 50% of the world's users on Windows XP and 50% of the world's users on IE. It's that most of, half of those IE users, 25% of the world's users, are going to be on XP, which means that they're not going to be able to get IE 9. They're not going to be able to see all this amazing stuff. 25% of the world is a lot. I don't know about you, but I can't write a new application and sort of ignore 25%. So Windows XP is 50%, right? That's, that's where the deployed base is today. So how good is the decay rate, right? If we look back and see how IE's been doing generally, well, that's um, going to be a long time uh, if, if our goal is to, to stop thinking about that. Um, so let's look at Windows Vista and Windows 7, right? So in four years, they've gone from 0 to 35% of the market. Um, at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, four years, that's pretty good, 35%. Uh, but I don't know about you, but and I don't want to be thinking about um, IE8 in another four years. I want to be thinking about IE12 or Chrome 
47, whatever it's going to be. <laughs> so we have a problem. OK. Uh, we've got this legacy burden. We don't necessarily have a, a fast path to get out of it. And we need some way to continue to deliver these really compelling experiences. And we, we need to be able to break the desktop web free of the constraints in the same way that we've broken the mobile web free of the, the constraints of thinking about legacy browsers. Part of this is about giving ourselves permission to think about HTML5. As you sit down to build an application, there's some capabilities that have allegories in JavaScript libraries, or they can be shimmed in with polyfills. Those are the sorts of things that you can use um, in a degradable way if the semantic of HTML is close enough to what it is you were trying to say in HTML5 or in the new stuff. Um, but there's a whole series of capabilities, things that are fundamentally new to the platform, things like WebGL, that don't have an allegory. There's no fallback for WebGL. There's no degraded view of it. There's no semantic WebGL. And so the result is that you're going to be making more and more hard decisions about delivering and using new capabilities in the platform as you move forward. So we want to give ourselves permission to use HTML5, and that means giving our customers permission to give us permission to use HTML5. We need them to consider HTML5 to be a viable option for an application delivery platform, which means that we need them to be able to run browsers that can do that. Well, that's a long slog, too. As we've seen before in the upgrade for Netscape 4, uh, enterprises and large IT organizations move slowly. They move in large chunks, but they move slowly. And so we want to make sure that we can continue to build new apps without necessarily being hamstrung by the slowest movers in the pack so that we can build really compelling experiences that drag the tailing edge of the envelope up closer to the front so that everybody gets the new shiny faster, which is what we want. We want auto-updating browsers everywhere. And Google Chrome Frame can help. So Google Chrome Frame, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a bridge of sorts. Instead of asking users to replace their browser or asking IT organizations to run two browsers, Google Chrome Frame puts the power of Google Chrome inside of Internet Explorer. Not for every page, not all the time, but it puts it there only when you ask it to be enabled, and it falls back easily. It renders entire pages in Chrome's rendering engine, not just a little cut out portion of the page. You opt in your entire page to it, um, which means that it is always opt in, and it's one line to add it to your site. Um, Chrome Frame tr strives to be completely seamless, though, so that users don't necessarily know that they're being asked to view something through a plugin. Uh, things fall back to the IE rendering engine if Chrome Frame isn't there. And so uh, as a result of our focus on delivering a seamless upgrade to the user experience, Chrome Frame has to share the network cache. It has to share cookies. It has to share a lot of the state, including things like clearing your caches or privacy management um, with IE. So, that when you log in on a page that didn't have Chrome Frame enabled and you go to a page that does, the cookies that were issued to you in that process uh, work in both places seamlessly. Chrome Frame tries really hard to make sure that um, something that happens in regular IE is going to continue to work in Chrome Frame and vice versa, that you're not going to see um, uh, chosen protocol attacks or security issues. So how does it work? So th those of you who... Um, what I get for being emphatic. Uh, so for those of you uh, who aren't really great at reading these diagrams, let me explain this. So the, the top block here is the process that is Internet Explorer. So when you launch Internet Explorer or you launch any browser, it creates a process in your desktop. And that browser process does a lot of stuff. In Chrome, it creates a process which manages other processes. And in many modern browsers, that happens too. IE8, IE9 all have the same sort of multi-process architecture. And so there's a, there's a browser process which manages the, the task of getting network resources, handing them back to the thing that's actually going to render them. And what Chrome Frame does is instead of using the native MSHTML control for rendering them, it hands that content back down to a Chrome browser process, which again has a multi-process system inside of it. So we get the advantages of Chrome sandboxing, reliability, uh, automatically updated plugins with Flash. Um, those sorts of advantages all happen when you enable Google Chrome Frame, and only a small portion of the system lives inside of the host browser. We don't start up the Chrome process until uh, your page asks for it to start up. So Chrome Frame delivers speed as a primary feature. We've, we've always thought that speed is a primary feature for Chrome, and it's a primary feature for Chrome because it's a primary feature for your apps. So V8 helps your JavaScript go faster. It parses, runs, and 
executes JavaScript very quickly indeed. And Chrome Frame is able to deliver some network op optimizations that aren't available normally on IE for things like automatically pre-scanning the documents that are, as they're being loaded to go fetch DNS uh, requests more quickly. We can bump the number of network connections that are available to pages even in IE6. And so a whole set of things are available to you through Chrome Frame that make your apps faster. Um, and in fact, Gmail today now supports Chrome Frame. If you have Chrome Frame installed on IE and you visit Gmail, you're probably going to be seeing that page rendered with Chrome Frame. The easiest way to tell if your page is being rendered in Chrome Frame is to right click on it and see if the About Google Chrome Frame or Inspect Element uh, right click menu show up. Otherwise, you might not know. But for the users who have it, we're seeing that in lab tests, Gmail is running 30% faster for those users on average, uh, even on high latency connections. It's a significant improvement, and it's the sort of thing that we think we might be able to do for your apps too. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not clear that that's always a win, right? We have to start up the Chrome process when we launch uh, a, a document that's going to be rendered in Chrome Frame, and that can take a little bit of time. So the, the performance question isn't necessarily um, yes, it's always faster, and no, it's not always faster. We have to start the browser process. We have to start the renderer process. We're buffering at the same time, which helps in that case. It doesn't slow us down necessarily, but we have this window where Chrome starting up might slow down the overall loading of your application, particularly if it's small or simple. And so testing your application, because opting in has been so easy, uh, to, traditionally has been one line. You can put this behind a flag. You can toggle it. You can run your performance tests. Getting a page to opt into Chrome Frame when it's available is just sending one HTTP header or one meta tag toward the top of your page, and that's it. That's really simple. Um, but what about for apps that don't have, where you don't have the source code to, or you're, you're trying to test out Chrome Frame against somebody else's application or an old version of yours to see how fast it could go? We added a registry key in the last year or so that gives us the ability to turn Chrome Frame into, into the default renderer. As I said earlier, Chrome Frame is only enabled for pages that opt into it with one of those two tags, uh, that HTTP header or the meta tag. But many users asked us for a way to say, hey, I love Chrome Frame. I've only got a couple of pages that I still want to see rendered in IE. There's some legacy application. I want to change that default policy. So the Chrome Frame default policy hasn't changed, but you can change it yourself with a registry setting which says, is default renderer one? In this case, Chrome Frame will be the, the way that all pages that you browse to in IE are rendered more or less, unless you explicitly configure a list of other options which are available to you. Um, but we send Chrome's user agent and not IE's. Traditionally speaking, when Chrome Frame renders a page, we send IE's user agent string with the appended word Chrome Frame and then a version number so that you can detect on the server side whether or not Chrome Frame is available for you to send different content to if you're doing content sniffing or user agent sniffing, uh, which many large sites do. But in this case, in order for this to be seamless, we want to send Chrome's user agent string. It turns out this is the easiest way for you to test whether or not your site is going to work in Chrome Frame without even opting into it on the server side. You can just toggle this flag in the client, reload the site, and see that your pages are rendered in Chrome Frame. Run your performance tests and understand how that's going to impact things, which is pretty good. So if you happen to have a lot of VMs up and running that you've juggled that have IE6, 7, 8, um, and Chrome Frame installed on all of them, you can set this flag and then see how it's going to uh, do side by side, uh, side by side, how it's going to impact the load times and the run times of your, of your applications. Well, that's pretty good, but it's not great, right? It still means you have to have these VMs or you have to have physical boxes that have all of these different versions of browsers. It's sort of a testing burden. Um, and so if you haven't used Pat Meenan's webpagetest.org, I recommend that you start using it for your uh, performance testing. He's now a Googler, but he started this project when he was at AOL. And it's a fantastic resource for understanding exactly what's happening when you load a page. And so uh, thanks to the team uh, that works on webpagetest.org, particularly Pat Meenan, there's now experimental support for Google Chrome Frame, which means that when you navigate to web page test um, in certain data centers, when you navigate to web page test, ah, yes. Um, it'll look like this. And, uh, You'll see that in the Dulles uh, Virginia data center, there's now an option at the bottom here for Chrome Frame, which means that you can run uh, test your sites on Chrome Frame with IE6 as the host browser and see how they perform. So I'm not going to do that right now, but um, you can type in any website. I'll try my blog. 
And if I click on advanced settings, you can even get video uh, and see a side by side or start to see a, a, a set of screenshots that are taken as, as your page is loaded in this browser to sort of understand visually what's happening when you load. Um, it's a great tool. You can change uh, the available bandwidth, so you can test in a series of bandwidth scenarios, and you get waterfalls and, and a huge amount of information about making your pages faster. So that's great. Uh, and WebPageTest will now allow you to compare before and after with or without Chrome Frame. That's awesome. So let's see how it works on a real web page. All right, so we've done, we've run a couple of these tests. And we, uh, web page test, by default, clears its cache before, between runs, but it does give you um, as many runs of this test as you'd like, and it'll let you see wh what that page will look like with or without a warm cache. So TechCrunch, for instance, is, a, is just a content site, right? It, it's, it's not a big web app like, say, uh, Gmail. It's a content site. And as a result, you might think that Chrome Frame might not have a lot to offer. We've spent a lot of time speeding up Chrome, but because V8 isn't going to be the thing that's going to be the bottleneck here, or JavaScript per se, you might expect that Chrome Frame might not uh, be able to help you out. At the top, we've got TechCrunch rendering under IE8. It doesn't render really well under IE7 or 6, so um, we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt, render it in IE8. At the bottom, we've got TechCrunch being rendered under Chrome Frame on IE6. So, um, what we've got here is that a little bit of delay for Chrome Frame to start up, but then once it loads, it's effectively done loading significantly faster than IE. Um, so we're done at 17 and a half seconds, and we can keep going, keep going, keep. Okay, yes, there we are. Um, so Chrome Frame has huge value in potentially uh, simple scenarios where you th might think that there's not a lot to to gain from. Uh, opting into a different mode. The same thing is true of the cache, which is actually uh, a fascinating point. Um, you might think that this is network bound, that Chrome Frame can do a bunch of better things to the network. It turns out, uh, it's coming. It turns out that Chrome Frame uh, is able to do better just at rendering web pages than older browsers are. Modern browsers of every kind have a big leg up. They're built to different constraints. They're built in a world where you can assume that you have faster processors and more memory. And so as a result, um, we do significantly better, again, than uh, uh, stock versions of IE. Uh, so uh, webpagetest.org is a great way to do this. It's a great way to understand the performance of your site and understand the performance impact of Chrome Frame with regards to your site. So I don't know about you, but uh, Google latency is everything. And uh, if latency is a lot to your application, then Chrome Frame might be able to help. So we've spent a lot of time on the performance aspects, trying to get uh, Chrome Frame to work seamlessly with regards to the host browser, so things like security and privacy aren't an issue. Um, improving the performance of your applications, making sure that users aren't shocked um, when Chrome Frame isn't available. We have this nice fallback. Making it easy for you to do um, incremental upgrades to Chrome Frame, like, like many sites like Yahoo do, where yahoo.com now sends the Google Chrome Frame header and meta tag. And that means that they're not asking their users to install it, but if it's available, if Chrome Frame is installed, it'll flip into the Chrome Frame, in a Chrome Frame mode when it's there. And if it's not, you just get the default fallback rendering. Um, so for yahoo.com and for a lot of other big sites, you can opportunistically take advantage of the users who already have Chrome Frame. Um, and it's a one-line change, so we designed this to make it as seamless and easy for you to add to your application as possible. And we've done a lot of work in the install flow to make sure that Chrome Frame gets out of the way, because the important part isn't Chrome Frame, it's your application, right? We want you to be able to build HTML5 applications that work everywhere, that work well, um, but, but without having to get in front of your user, asking them to restart their browser, asking them to um, do something that feels unnatural. And we've built scripts and we've built infrastructure to help you prompt your users when you do build something like a WebGL-based application that doesn't have a fallback, that can't easily be um, incrementally upgraded to the latest HTML5 stuff. So CF install gives you a simple way, if you check the Chrome Frame documentation, to build an overlay, something that um, detects whether or not uh, you'd like Chrome Frame to be used um, based on a series of feature flags. And if Chrome Frame is something that you want for your users to have enabled, um, CF install will prompt and, and run you through this installation flow, returning your users to that page directly. But it does come at the cost of uh, prompting your users. So um, to help understand how we can make Chrome Frame more seamless, I'd like to bring Amit, my colleague, back up. 
Thanks, Alex. So CF install is quite useful, and it will allow your sites to create overlays uh, for install prompts. However, a lot of sites want more control over how to present users and install prompt. They want their own. They want to show their own branding. So uh, there has been requests from several of the developers to allow them uh, to do that, provide their own UI, and basically have an install flow where users are redirected back right after the install uh, to their own apps. So we did this for uh, a few custom apps, uh, like Orkut and Wave, where I'm not sure if you can see that, but there is a Chrome frame prompt right in the middle of apps. Uh, and what happens here is a user clicks here, uh, goes to the install flow, and the, after install, uh, it is, the user is redirected right back to our code in this case. Now, I'm very happy to announce that this is now available for everyone. All they have to do is create a custom prompt like our code did and uh, point it to this URL. And as you can see, uh, it, there is no uh, script needed. Uh, after the install, user is redirected right back to the referring page. So that should uh, allow you to create uh, install prompts um, in a way that you want to show users with your, your own branding, and uh, it could be pretty seamless. We are thinking uh, how we can further simplify the install process. Uh, maybe shorten it a little bit, uh, because uh, downloading and install is a time-consuming process, and we are thinking we have like 120 million Chrome active users, and a lot more installs that are not active, that are just sitting there. So, uh, and the thing about those installs is, Chrome Frame is part of Chrome. Um, a lot of infra infrastructure that Chrome Frame uses is already there on a Chrome install, so why not use that directly? Uh, so I'm very excited to announce we have a mode where we can leverage all those existing Chrome installs to uh, provide you even quicker, quicker way of installing Chrome Frame, basically totally avoiding download and um, kind of a just quick enable. So let's see how that works. So I have a VM here with, uh, as you can see, this is Chrome installs. You can probably see from the icon. And uh, let's see how the install flow will look like in this case. I'm going to the, I launched IE. Uh, going to the Chrome Frame download page. When I usually go there, I get a download Chrome Frame now button. But if you can see this now, what I see instead is an activate Google Chrome Frame. So what has happened is uh, the page has detected that Chrome is already present here. And it can be instantly activated. So I'll just follow through this flow. Uh, so ac accept and install becomes accept and activate. And uh, so this will kick off the installer. As you can see, uh, there is no downloading Chrome Frame. Uh, it is basically using the existing uh, part of installer. It is invoking the existing installer that is already there on the machine and configuring it to enable Chrome Frame. So right, and once this is done, this was configured with uh, redirecting back to Orkut. And as you can see, this thing is loaded in Chrome Frame. So instead of uh, you getting the Internet Explorer menu, uh, you get the Chrome Frame menu. And you can see about Chrome Frame here. So Chrome Frame is pretty seamless. It loads. And uh, if your app prompts Chrome Frame using this way, uh, as you can see, the install happens quickly, and it, the user gets right back at the referring page. That is your app. So one other uh, concern every, uh, developers had regarding Chrome Frame is Chrome Frame is a plugin, and it needs admin rights to install. So a common question is, if I start prompting users to install, it's fine if 
people have Chrome, and in that case, uh, the flow is uh, pretty smooth. Uh, what happens to others? Uh, what happens if users are not administrators on that machine? How many, uh, how many users will I lose is, is, is the underlying question. Uh, internally, we found out that our installs are aborted about 30% of the time due to lack of admin rights on a, on a machine. So this was a pretty important issue to solve. And I'm excited to announce today that we have a Chrome version of Chrome Frame today. We are launching it today in Dev Channel that does not require admin rights. Thank you. So let's see uh, how that works. So as you can see, this is a Windows 7 machine. And this is a user account control settings dialog in which uh, the US is set to always notify. Uh, in which, so if you want to do anything significant on the machine, you'll get a very familiar USC prompt. I'm going to launch IE. And uh, so of course, any install on this machine uh, is impossible uh, without a USC prompt. And a user is not an admin on this machine. Uh, I guess he wouldn't even get a USC prompt, and the install will just fail silently. So you saw the Mr. Doob's demo, Cloud's demo, from the slides. Uh, this is the latest version of Internet Explorer, uh, and see how that works inside IE. Uh, unfortunately, it needs WebGL. So you see a prompt saying, sorry, your browser doesn't support WebGL. Uh, please try with the uh, latest browser. Now I'm going to go to install Chrome Frame. So I go to the download page. Now there is no Chrome installed on this machine. So I get, get Google Chrome Frame as opposed to activate Chrome Frame that you just saw earlier. Click Install, and this is the download thing. Uh, now it will download Chrome, and it will go through the install process. So being admin has been a, in a major concern uh, for a lot of developers, and we have heard over and over again. And uh, yeah, it's so good to be able to uh, to finally have a version of Chrome Frame that doesn't need an admin. In fact, this was a major roadblock in delivering the quick enable because we already we always had all the infrastructure for Chrome Frame uh, residing in Chrome. Chrome and Chrome Frame are part of the same build infrastructure. They share the same installer. Uh, they share the same set of binaries. If you look at the diagram that Alex uh, described, you can see Chrome Frame launches Chrome. So it's just a small addition over Chrome. Uh, so we always wanted to do that. And uh, having this uh, is a, a great missing piece that we were, we were able to build on. So the installation is complete. Now let's go back to the Cloud's demo and see how that works. So you have Mr. Doob's Cloud's working in Internet Explorer. So currently, uh, the user level Chrome frame is available in Dev Channel. And uh, you would use this URL. Uh, if you don't see it far back, uh, this will be available on the slide. Uh, we'll also make a posting on Chrome Frame user forums uh, in case uh, uh, it's not clear. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll invite Alex for, uh, to talk about enterprise support. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thanks. So what you just saw may sound amazing to you as a web developer, the ability to, to install Chrome Frame, not have to restart your browser, have it work per user without admin rights. But this scares the bejesus out of a lot of IT administrators, and admi admittedly, their concerns aren't wrong. If you're an IT administrator, you want your users to be running a lockdown configuration. So over the last year, we've been doing a lot of work to make sure that Chrome and Chrome Frame are able to be administrated by you uh, in the way that you want, including controls for group policy and group policy templates to help you roll out a lot of the custom configuration that Chrome Frame 
um, needs in order to allow you to do things like flipping the default renderer or providing a list of URLs to be rendered in Chrome Frame or in IE, depending on which way you have that policy set. And our, one of our most requested features was MSI installers. We've got MSI installers now, both for Chrome and for Chrome Frame. They're released roughly on the same schedule as the regular Google Chrome updates. And those are available for you to push out over software update inside of your enterprise. So that instead of having your users necessarily have to try to do this and fail or go around you, uh, you can centrally control this um, through the group uh, policy mechanism. And those policy mechanisms allow you to do things like control auto updates. This is one of our most requested features. The group policy controls that are available for Chrome and Chrome Frame allow you to control when updates to Chrome and Chrome Frame are rolled out inside of your enterprise. And so with that, I want to say uh, thanks. We've got a lot of time left for questions. So um, we have mics here and at the back. And so um, uh, welcome to Emmett back up. But thanks a lot for coming. And uh, looking forward to what you have to ask us about. Questions? Hey there. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thanks. This is probably one of the single most uh, <laughs> time-saving devices in uh, releasing us web developers from the shackles of IE. Um, uh, my question, I have a couple questions about uh, user agent. Um, uh, one, will we, will, is the user, user agent unique enough for us to be able to distinguish uh, distinguish it in uh, like Google Analytics. Um. Google Analytics has support today for Chrome Frame. So if you uh, check out your Google, Google Analytics browser stats, um, Chrome Frame is broken out separately uh, than regular IE. Awesome. And then second, and this may be more of a question for the, the GWT team, um, but do you know if the user agent um, for Chrome Frame behaves, talks and uh, smells like a uh, a Chrome user agent on the GWT side? I think they're, uh, I'm not sure about the current state of that patch. Um, it's a trivial patch. Basically, uh, there is a question about whether or not your app is going to be designed to send differential content to uh, IE or Chrome. So GWT does per browser compilation, which means that you'd sort of have to decide whether or not your app is going to opt in to um, saying, yes, we support Chrome Frame, in which case you want to detect user agents that are IE but have the Chrome Frame um, string inside of them as Chrome Frame, and then treat them like Chrome and bucket them into that group. Uh, but it's not a, a cut and dried thing for GWT, right? You, you certainly want to know that your application is going to be configured to, to send the header or the meta tag. Else, you might be sending the wrong content to the wrong browser. So, um, so it's, support for that for that user agent string is that like a patch that's coming? You know, I, I think it is. Uh, I will I will check with the GWT team and uh, please check, ask back on the user forums, and we'll we'll get the answer sorted for you. Thanks. Uh, our web application uses uh, HTML5 SQLite for persistence, and we're wondering if Chrome Frame supports that as well. Chrome Frame does support the uh, Web SQL database uh, that's currently shipping in Chrome. It's worth noting that Web SQL database doesn't have legs necessarily. Uh, web Index DB is kind of the, the new preferred API for doing storage on the client. Um, the Web SQL uh, API spec sort of hasn't gotten a warm reception in the standards world. So, um, but Chrome and Chrome Frame do support Web Index DB as well. Thank you. Yeah, quick question. Uh, the amount of user base that you have as far as IE6, 7, and 8, uh, as many IE6, 7, 8 users there are, how many would you say are actually using uh, Chrome Frame right now? So we haven't um, sort of announced uh, Chrome Frame usage numbers. Um, I think the primary thing for us as the Chrome Frame team isn't necessarily how many users are using it, because that's a proxy for you about um, how many users are going to be seeing this prompt, right? It's how quickly is Chrome Frame going to get out of my way, or how, how many users can, can use this um, if I ask my users uh, to need or uh, enable Chrome Frame. And so, um, we're focused on how we can reduce the barriers to web developers to adopt HTML5 
and adoption is one of those things, but creating compelling content, adding new APIs, making it possible for you to build new stuff that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise um, is sort of the other key thing. And we need your help uh, to build really awesome, amazing websites that um, couldn't be done any other way, and, and then to, uh, to use those to help us bring modern browsers to everybody. Licensing accommodate the use case of distributing uh, frame, uh, Chrome Frame with uh, a product, say on a CD or something to that effect? Uh, I guess we'll have to check up on that. Yeah, I think we'll have to check. But the MSI installer um, is available for you to use inside of your enterprise. I'm not sure about uh, outward distribution. I can check with legal. So what about Firefox? Well, Firefox isn't, um, I don't know. As a web developer, Firefox is not my big problem. Uh, right? It's not the squeaky wheel. So um, it's not really clear that uh, Firefox needs to help. They're doing a great job. The Firefox team uh, is really doing some amazing work with Firefox 4, uh, and I hope to keep it up. They've committed to a faster update and release cycle, so I'm excited to see what happens there, too. Hi. Uh, can Chrome fan be hosted in a private enterprise network in, you know, where they don't have internet access? Yes. So the question was, can Chrome Frame be uh, hosted inside of, yeah. Um, and the answer is yes. There is a bug that was just surfaced in the last couple of weeks about uh, the installer pinging home um, and, and blocking. So we're working through that. Uh, today, the installation is slower than it needs to be. Uh, but we're working to make sure that that's uh, resolved quickly. But the answer is yes. Uh, you can take the MSI push it out through your enterprise and have no, zero network connectivity to the outside world. Awesome. Good. Uh, great work, you guys. Um, since Chrome has Flash built into it, does Chrome Frame also? Chrome Frame does include all of Chrome, including the built-in version of Flash. Flash. Right. So you could have basically an IE6 that has an older version of Flash and then Chrome Frame that has a newer. Yes, uh, but we're committed to, I mean, uh, the good news there, Yes, we're committed to giving users a secure browsing experience with Chrome. Uh, that's why we don't make old versions of Chrome available, generally speaking. Um, old code is code that's going to root you. Uh, but if your site uh, opts in to that page, well, then you're going to get the Chrome experience, right? But it is up to your page. It's up to your site to opt in. You're never going to be ambushed. Your content is never going to be running under a, a hostile, unknowing, unloving browser. Um, you get to choose which, which mode you get. So VHO, does Chrome Frame allow you access to little c Chrome of IE, the Chrome? Yeah, I understand. Uh, so Chrome Frame does not give you APIs for accessing or scripting or working with the, uh, the, the visual UI that lives around the content area. Chrome Frame is, uh, again, it's an active document server. So it effectively just sort of lives inside that square area between the scroll bars. Um, and, and it doesn't really have an interaction with the outside world. Think of it as a PDF. So it works in a similar way as PDF uh, reader does. Um, is the Chrome Frame cache integrated with IE's cache? As in, if you clear your IE cache settings, uh, does it clear the Chrome Frame cache as well? Great question. Yes, the Chrome Frame. Uh, IE8 introduced APIs for uh, coordinating that process. So in IE8 and upward, um, when you clear one part of the cache, Chrome will try to clear the Chrome Frame will try to clear the analogous part of the cache for Chrome Frame. In older versions of Chrome Frame, uh, we actually blow away everything when you clear the cache. Uh, we don't want user data leaking out or uh, your privacy to be to ever be um, uh, put in jeopardy because you're browsing the web with Chrome Frame. Um, and in terms of cache, are they actually stored in separate directories, or are, are they still in the IE's cache directory? Again, a great question. The reason that they're blown away in IE 6 and 7 is that they are stored in the same cache directory. So we actually put the user data directory for Chrome inside the IE cache directory. So when you clear it in IE 6 and 7, it just goes away. Um, in IE 8 and upward, we can manage it independently because we have the API access that Microsoft added. And so um, we can store it independently. It lives near to where your regular Chrome uh, user data directory would, um, but it is managed independently. So about cache, actually, Chrome Frame uses VNINet uh, or Arumon, which is IE's network stack. So Chrome Frame's cache is IE's cache. 
so but there's other data like the, the yeah. index database and that sort of thing, which we can't mm -hmm. rely on IE for. So that also gets, as Alex mentioned, that also gets cleaned up when you clear IE's history. There's a lot of work in any browser. Uh, there's a lot of data that you need to have around um, things, not just like your user uh, history or your cache, but also things like the safe browsing list, um, the auto-update system. All that stuff has to live someplace. And so even though we do use IE's cache for almost everything, uh, we do have to carve out separate space for certain operations. Thank you. Hi, one question here. Um, I wonder, I'm curious how you achieved to install Google Chrome Frame without requiring admin rights on Windows 7? Uh, we can talk offline. Okay. Uh, what, is there any, uh, like a, Well, it's a, it's a detailed technical discussion, and I'm not sure uh, every web developer or HTML5 developer is interested in that. Can I take a, I can, can I take a shot at yeah. that quick answer? Go ahead. Um, as you saw in that, that process diagram, um, a very small part of Chrome Frame lives inside of the process space of IE. This is how BHOs, which are these little components that IE decides to load up at startup time work. Um, we need some way to get Chrome Frame loaded. We figured out a way to do that. And so once that's done, everything else can work as normal. We just have to be inside the process space. And, and just to confirm what you showed uh, previously, you didn't have Chrome installed on the machine, right? We uh, showed two different ways. Like the, the second demo, you didn't have a Chrome install, you just run from. That's correct, site. yeah. Okay. And the second question, um, what's the story of WebGL on X Windows XP? Does Chrome, Google Chrome Frame support WebGL on XP? Yes, it does. Okay. And does it mean that it also brings all the security issues on XP as well? Well, the security issues for WebGL are interesting. Um, and uh, Chrome has. Uh, done a lot of work to make sure that the commands that are sent to the GPU have been pre-processed. Um, there's a separate rendering process for GL commands uh, and an integrated pipeline for sending stuff out so that we have a place to verify what's getting sent to the GPU. Uh, we've got a lot of work happening uh, for things like shader verification to make sure that uh, when you use a WebGL shader, it isn't going to be sent sort of naked um, down to the GPU. And there's also a blacklist and whitelist for, for graphics drivers. Not everybody is going to get regular raw rendering um, down, to, uh, down to what the graphics card provides, because you know, uh, graphics drivers are not known for being the most secure code in the world. They weren't necessarily written to be exposed to all the web's content. And so today, you're saying that it's possible to write bad web, G web, C sorry, web gel code that can crash the machine. Uh, I didn't say that. I'm saying that that's something well, that we're working that hard possible? to do. It's, it's possible to write code that'll, in anything that will crash lots of stuff. Um, but uh, no, uh, if it is, if you do see a crash like that, um, you know, that's something that we need to work on. That's not the promise of the web. Okay, thanks. Can you tell us what Microsoft are making of this? Are they positive about it? Or how do we uh, my name is Giorgio, I work in. They cut my microphone because I'm working mic, so. Uh, I'm an HTML5 evangelist, so I love HTML5, and I'm one of those evangelizing HTML5. Thanks so you can ask him. I'd love to be there if you get an answer. I would love to know what they think. Any other questions? Yes. So he has a question for you. Let's, let's use the mics. Great. Well, this is not my presentation, but the question is, uh, what does Microsoft think about Google Chrome Frame? Uh, I think Google is doing great stuff with the browser. Uh, I invite you to try it. Like, if you really care about HTML5, I think Chrome is a good browser. Internet Explorer 9 is an awesome browser, so try the real browsers. Uh, those seems to me like uh, additional solution that can just expose users to additional security risks and, and other concerns. And then I'm curious to talk offline with the uh, Chrome team about this as well. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for being here. Any other questions? All right. Thank you guys for being here. And you guys have been awesome. Thanks.